Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the first French Pinball Collective Seminar. We have uh, our resident pinball master here in Richmond. For those of you elsewhere in the world, uh, he is the host of the Four Amusement Only, EM and Bingo Pinball Podcast. If I hadn't seen his shirt, I might have mixed that up. <laughs> All right, without further ado, Mr. Nick Baldridge. This class is going to be pretty basic. You know, we're going to go through some components. We're going to talk about electricity, technical theory a little bit. And um, first, I just wanted to get started and uh, talk about a little bit of the history of pinball. Because uh, one thing that's kind of common to all machines is where it started. Uh, 1931, the first widely accepted coin-operated pinball machine was made. Uh, that game was purely mechanical. No electricity, no electrified bumpers, no flippers, <coughs> no switches. The ball would roll down the play field, hit pins, and land in pockets that would score. That type of machine carried on for several years. Hundreds of machines made that were purely mechanical. The next era was the electromechanic, and manufacturers started adding batteries. The batteries would electrify coils or switches and do different things. Um, they eventually added scoring, uh, new capabilities, uh, the ability to kick the ball back up the play field, ramps, all kinds of things were added in the 1930s and 1940s. Then World War II happened. World War II stopped all pinball manufacturing. There were some conversion companies that would take existing pinball machines, strip the art off, put new art on, and put that into service. You just plug it back into your game. You have a brand new game, new backlights, good to go. Then after the war, a ton of innovation happened. After the war, flippers were invented, 1947. That changed a whole lot of things, but the same basic components remained from those early electromechanical games. Working on a game from the 1930s is very similar to working on a game from the 1970s, or even a modern game. All the components are very similar all the way through. Uh, not much is new under the sun. So, let's talk a little bit about electrical basics. Uh, electricity comes from a source, be that a battery or the wall. Um, you plug a machine in, or you have what's called a dry cell battery that drives the whole thing. Early machines from the 1930s used these dry cell batteries. The advantage of that is that you can put the machine anywhere. Uh, it can be a place that doesn't have electricity. It's fantastic. Earn money while you sleep. But um, eventually, they started adding more and more capability, more things uh, to the machines than could be driven by a battery. And at that point, they made them plug in and they continue on. So you have your source, battery or outlet, and then you have uh, three things which are necessary for the flow of electricity. And electricity does flow, it's kind of like water. Uh, you have electrical pressure or potential, that's voltage. Then you have current, that's the actual flow, that's called amperage. And then you have a load, and that's resistance. A load can be anything, it can be a coil, it can be a relay. It can be a motor, it can be a lamp, it can be absolutely anything that's driven by electricity in the machine. Uh, so all those things together make a circuit. You have your source, you have the potential that that source provides, you have the current that flows through the load and then back to the source. So how do you, uh, how do you get electricity to flow? Well, the first component is a transformer. Transformer takes your line voltage and steps it down. And it steps it down in a couple different ways, typically. It'll step it down to coil voltage to drive your flippers, to drive uh, your kickers, or uh, your pop bumpers, anything like that. Uh, it'll also step it down to approximately six volts to drive your lamps. And uh, you only need one transformer per game. Typically, there's only one. Uh, Games can have more than one, depending on if they need to step down multiple times in ways that uh, this one transformer can't provide. So, 
uh, transformer, you got it. That's your source. Comes from the wall, goes to the transformer, is converted to energy. Then uh, the next thing that you have are coils. And coils, quite simply, are uh, they're similar to transformers, and the transformers are just wound wire around a core. The more times you wind the wire, the more powerful or unpowerful uh, the transformer becomes. A coil is very similar. You have what's called the bobbin, just a plastic piece, and then you have wire that's wrapped around it. The number of times it's wrapped around and the gauge of the wire determines the strength of the coil. This coil is driven, and then makes a sound. Coils can do all kinds of different things. I've mentioned a few other things, pop bumpers, flippers, drop target resets, bank resets, all kinds of things. Um, so, moving on, we've got switches. In electromechanical games, switches are typically leaf switches. There are certain switches which are micro switches. But switches come in three different varieties. We have normally closed, we have normally open, and then we have what's called single pull, double throw, or also make break. Now a normally closed switch is exactly what it sounds like. It's pressed together, and then when the ball rolls over it, it will open up, breaking the circuit. A normally open switch would be something like a lane at the top of the play field. The ball rolls over that and it closes the switch and tells the game to score or do something. And then you have a single pull, double throw. That's a switch that changes the state of the game. So when the switch is activated, it goes from one side to another and changes which switch is electrified. So one way that you can build up electromechanical logic is with a relay. A relay is a combination of switches and a coil. When this coil is pulsed, it changes the state of the switches which are attached. You can have multiple switches attached, each of which connects to different circuits or even different relays. One relay can trigger another. One relay can trigger something like a pop bumper. One relay can trigger an old friend bell. A relay can do just about anything. They're the basic building blocks of logic within an EM machine. Relays come in different flavors as well. You've got this type, which is pretty straightforward. It's just a relay that can be pulsed. Then you have this type. This is called a trip relay. A trip relay has two states, on and off, just like a regular relay. But the difference is, once it's tripped, it cannot go back unless the entire bank is reset. These are typically used for keeping track game state. If you have a sequence that the game is keeping track of, uh, for example, you might have numbered targets on the play field. You have to hit one through five and then something else will happen. The way the game keeps track of that is not with these, which would have to be held closed. It's with these that are pulsed and then drop. And once all of them drop, then the game can figure out, oh, I need to do whatever. Open a gate. Um, give you an extra ball whatever the case may be. So let's talk about um, connectivity within a game. Pinball machines have a lot of switches. A lot of relays. They have a lot of these other units. But the way that the game can be broken apart, it has to be modular. You have to be able to take it apart and put it back together. And you have to be able to do it reliably and quickly. And the way that that was facilitated is with these, Jones plugs. Jones plugs come in male and female variety. And they allow you to quickly disconnect the head from the body. Or in electromechanical machines, there's a relay board, which sits on the bottom of the game. And that can also be removed with Jones plugs. Same with the play field. The play field typically has from one to three Jones plugs. Remove those, take the play field out of the game. Makes it easy to work on. So, one of the more complex units is this. 
It's called a step switch. But if you break it down, it's very similar to a regular switch. Okay. The thing is, though, it rotates around. So as a coil is pulsed, you can see it changes state. Every time it moves, it's connecting different circuits. It's like a rotary relay. because it remains in that state until that coil is pulsed again. There's nothing to hold there. You just pulse it, it moves, and it's on. This is a different type of stepper. And these have been in use for a very long time, since the 1930s. They were used clear up to the 1970s, all the way to the end. So the same basics apply Mechanical game that uses these steppers. Um, some of the very earliest ones had no need for uh, electrical toe warning, so there were no steppers. But uh, just about anything that has a score in the backboard would use one of those. Uh, next, we've got motors. Those come in several different varieties. A motor is simply a coil that, when driven, will actually rotate something. So in this case, it rotates these cams. I managed to get one that was completely frozen up. Okay. <laughs> That's good. That came from my parts bin. Now you see why. All right. And this is a Gottlieb motor. This is a score motor. It rotates around. And as you can see, it activates a bunch of different switches, which are in this carousel here. Each of the switches does something different. And the way the game keeps track of it is with these relays. If this relay is held down, one of the switches will complete a circuit. If this relay is not held down, it can't complete the circuit. So in that way, the score motor can have a huge effect on the game without the need for uh, every switch to do something every single time the score motor rotates. The score motor acts as kind of the brain it does uh, a lot of calculation for the game. If you have a target that you hit and it scores a multiple of a certain number of points, let's say the basic point is one. You hit a target, you get one point. All right, that happens with a relay. If you hit a target, you get five points. The score motor has to rotate, and it has to pulse the switch five times. And those five times, it's going to pulse this relay. So the same component is actuated each time you score, it just depends on what the target is that caused it. So, um, moving on to how to fix it. Um, actually, let's uh, step back just a second. Sorry about that. Let's talk about fuses. These are very important, very simple. Probably most of you know what a fuse is, but just in case. This is a typical size of a fuse in a pinball machine. The electromechanical machines, uh, typical sizes are 5, 10, 15 amps. And that's the amount of current that's required before that fuse breaks. So the fuse is just a piece of wire, basically. And when a certain amount of current flows through it, it will heat up enough to actually pop and break. There'll be more current to flow through. And that way it protects your machine, protects these devices, keeps these coils from burning up, keeps your switches from catching on fire, <laughs> all that kind of good stuff. So if you have a motor that's binding, like my old shutter motor friend here, your fuse is going to pop. You can't drive it. You can't move it. So that's a good thing. Uh, so before we get into repair, let's talk about tools. I've got several here. Switch adjuster. This is your best friend uh, for electromechanical games, solid state games, and pen. Um, resist the urge to use medium nose pliers. It's a direct tool for the job. A switch adjuster uh, that is properly made will serve you well. This one is not stable. Um, it's, it's yours, I think. Um, 
I've had I've been through many that have broken. Um, this one from Pinball Resource. This is called an ignition file. This is used if your contacts are hidden in the engine. It allows you to reshape the contacts. You can also use them if the contacts are incredibly filthy and in order to clean them, switch. You do that, you put it between the switches, drop through gently a couple times. The thing with an ignition file, because it reshapes those contact points, you use it sparingly. sparingly. Um, otherwise, you'll flatten out the contacts and then your switch won't work anymore. You made a bigger problem. This is a lamp cleaning stick, so this is pinball resource as well. Uh, you can chuck it up in the drill and then use it to drill into a lamp socket to clean out the gum. It's kind of like a big pencil eraser. Um, works okay. It's not perfect. If you got a really cruddy socket, you got to replace it. But um, it sometimes helps bring the sockets back in. Um, electromechanical games. Typically only need just a handful of tools. That's another big thing about it. Aside from these specialized tools, you've got screwdrivers. Bye. Phil said, really good pair of pliers. This is a pair of vice grips, but any kind of pliers are good. Um, pliers are used to <coughs> taking the nuts off of this, taking apart clippers, those kind of things. Phil said, Flathead depends on your game and the era. Older games tend to use flatheads for pretty much everything. Um, more modern games, 1960s-ish up, tend to have some field set components, but almost every electromechanical game uses flatheads. So, so good screwdrivers are everything. And um, you show the, the technique that you use on the leaf adjustment tool? I know I had one and I was using it very much wrong until I saw the way that you do it. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so I've got this stack of switches. Every switch, this is this was the best part that I could get. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the best for display. Uh, let's imagine that the switch pair is just these top two. Um, it's comprised of a long blade and then a short blade. If you adjust the long blade, your switch will never act right again. <laughs> Always adjust the short blade, unless somebody has previously adjusted the long blade. And to do that, you put it as close to the base of uh, the switch stack as possible, and you simply twist. You just lightly feather it. Examine your work. Do it again if you need to. And this is if there's more space, like they've gotten squished together. If they've been squished together, here I've misadjusted it so that it's closed. Then you just do the opposite, twist it over to the right. Now it's open. Always test everything with the ball if it rolls over with the ball. If it's in a relay. Is it literally like you do like a feathers adjustment or are you just are you just bending like a screw steel? I'm just bending it like it's a steel. So it's fairly straightforward. It's one of those things that you kind of have to get the feel for. It's not just an Allen wrench. Not just an Allen wrench, no. Uh, nor needle nose pliers. Is it different from an Allen wrench? Yes, it's, it's a slotted okay, tool. I see. So you can grab that. You can stick it over that. Put it right on the leaf, and right. then you twist left or right. Now there's two different angles, and that's so that you can get into kind of funky areas, like your friend's corn motor here. Um, but most of the time, you're going to end up using the straight. So. Uh, a few different sites. Uh, Marco Specialties carries a few different switch adjusters, which are different shapes. Um, some of those work okay, some of them don't. And it's experimentation. I will tell you that this L shape switch adjuster, I use constantly, every game. So it's a good buy. Um, cleaning. This dovetails into repair. Most of the problems 
in an electromechanical game or dirt. They've been played to death. Uh, they've been sitting for decades. Uh, how do you fix them? I mean, this thing, the stepper, it's covered in dirt. It won't function properly unless it's clean. One of the tools, Scotch Bright Path. You can get uh, five of them for 350 at the hardware store. Take it, scrub on the rivets until they turn shiny. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Clean it. <laughs> um, once you've done that, though, you've stripped off whatever protective coating that the operator put on there, however long ago. So, whether it was that protective or not, it all depends. You know, I've had games where uh, they've put Vaseline on there when uh, certain types of grease and oils were not available. And that was very common in the 1940s. Well, the problem with Vaseline, over time, it'll turn into a rock. And then you've got to chip that off and uh, scrub away at it for a long time. So, that's where different types of lube come in. I'm kind of old school, and uh, I use red and white, three and one oil. Uh, however, there is something called Super Lube they sell at uh, the hardware store. Again, it's just a Teflon lube, but most of us have this in our hands. Uh, all it takes is a drop. Put it right on your finger and wipe it on. And a drop will pretty much do one stepper. It doesn't take very much. Does it uh, attract the nuclear dust later? Depends. Now, the downside of using this as opposed to Teflon based lube is that you have to play the game. If you put it in storage for a long time, you might have to end up going back through it. It all depends. You know, uh, it depends on if you're storing it in the barn too with the door. Um, so, if you're doing this to play the game, yeah, great one. <laughs> um, that brings us to motor lubrication. Lubrication is important for everything, but this is not the right tool for every job. You also have this 3-in-1. <laughs> I promise I don't work for the 3-in-1 oil company, but uh, the blue and white can is motor oil, and this is used to lubricate score motors. It's used to lubricate any motor that you have in your electromechanical game. Now you might look at this and say, uh, how do you lubricate this? It's just a bunch of stuff right here. All right. Most of the manufacturers have some kind of wick that you put the oil into. And when you drip the oil into there, it'll wick through and lubricate the parts of the motor that need lubrication. Um, in certain circumstances, like my friend here, I'm going to have to crack open the gearbox, chisel out whatever grease is inside there, and repack it. Um, that's more advanced. Uh, but periodic lubrication of the score motor and other motors is important. So, um, a few things that uh, you don't talk about in polite conversation, religion, politics, and clean pinball machines. Everybody's got their own techniques and uh, nobody wants to hear yours. So <laughs> I'll give you mine. Um, do with it what you will. This is an incredibly useful tool, 91% ISO alcohol. You don't use this on the play field, but you can use it to get grease off of a unit that's gummed up. Um, you can use it on switches if somebody has shot a bunch of grease into the switches. That happens more frequently than you might imagine. Uh, and uh, it's useful for getting grease off. Uh, for polishing metal, it's Mother's Mag and Aluminum Polish. You can get it from an auto parts store. Uh, they might also carry it at the hardware store. It's, uh, it does a pretty decent job of shining things up. Uh, requires a little bit of elbow grease. That's okay. Um, and then cleaning play fields uh, and plastics on play fields. There's a series of Plastic polish is called Novus, one, two, and three. Novus one is the least abrasive. It's basically uh, 
step up from stuff you want. Um, and then you get up to Novus 2, which is more abrasive, and Novus 3, which is incredibly abrasive. So depending on your plastic and the condition of it, you're going to want to step down, maybe from 3 to 2 to 1. It's incredibly rare to use 3 unless you've got a really messed up plastic. So uh, typically you're going to go 2 to 1, and 1's used to shine. Uh, for your play field, you can get this from auto parts stores, or you can get it from uh, Pinball Resource, or Amazon. just Amazon. Any anywhere that carries either auto supplies or pinball supplies is going to have it. Um, as far as cleaning your play field, for a modern game, which is clear coated, you're going to want to use Novus. It's like cleaning plastic. But for an older game, it may not be the right tool for the job. You can do that, and it'll shine things up, but it may damage the coating, especially on an older game. And we're talking 1930s older game. Uh, you want to be very careful the older the game is uh, not to damage the coating that's on top of the play field, or else you're going to damage the paint that's underneath of it. This would all roll and over. So um, notice, not the right tool for that job. In that case, uh, there's a few different things you can try. And I would suggest for anything of that nature, and actually any cleaning supply that you're going to put on the play field, put it somewhere inconspicuous first. Test it. See what it does. Put it in an area that doesn't have any paint, any ink. Um, otherwise, you may regret it. <laughs> um, so just test in an inconspicuous area first. What I use for a play field that's dirty is hand cleaner. Sounds really stupid, sounds abrasive and terrible, it works. Uh, the stuff called uh, Goop is the brand name, but uh, you can get it for a dollar at the auto parts store. It comes in a tub. Don't get the stuff in a tube, get the stuff in a tub. Uh, you want the stuff that does not have chunks of pumice in it, that'll just rip everything right off the play field. But uh, it comes, it's creamy, you can use it also. Double use. So uh, I use that. It works very well. Gets the grime off. Brings out a little shine. It's good. Then I wax. And uh, there's a few, there's again a million different things that people recommend. This is mill wax, this is what Pinball Resource recommends. Works very well, especially for older games. Uh, it's very simple to apply. It's a paste, uh, it's a liquid, not a paste. You put it on. Microfiber towel, wipe it on, let it haze up for a minute, buff it out. That's it. Um, Johnson's Paste Wax comes in a yellow can. That works pretty well as well. Uh, a lot of people recommend Caranuba Wax. I don't tend to prefer that because older games tend to have uh, wood which has split apart. And that's called plank. And when you use a Caranuba Wax or even Johnson's Wax in there, it'll leave uh, white lines all up and down your game. Makes it very visually uh, kind of gross. So uh, those little white chunks will come out as you're playing as well, get all over the play field, got to clean again. So using this works very well. Um, so let's see. Let's talk about repair. We jumped ahead a little bit. Let's jump back. Talk about switches. Uh, cleaning switches can be done. Our old friend the business card. Just stick it between the switches, hold them closed, and then pull it through. Got some dirt off. Just do it until you're reasonably certain that there's not a lot of dirt. There's no science to it really. Um, you just want it to be relatively clean. And you can come up and see it at the end here. Uh, Second tool, ignition file, I demonstrated that. Just drag it through a couple times. That'll clean off the basic junk. Uh, you want to be careful with that tool again because it will damage the switches. You're actually filing them off metal. The most important tool for cleaning switches, though, is making sure that they're properly adjusted. Switches, by their nature, will actually wipe against each other. So the top blade will wipe against the bottom blade, and that 
mechanical action will actually clean the switch or keep it clean. When you hear people say that EMs like to be played, that's what they mean. If you don't, the dirt will build up between the switches and they won't be able to sense the switch because it feeds the current. Uh, motors. All right, I've got a perfect example. For any game that I get, I like to check the motor, see if it will turn by hand. Examining the cams, which are these circular parts here, and then the switch stacks on top, you can typically see which direction the motor needs to turn. And then just turn the cams by hand. It won't hurt anything. Uh, if it can make a revolution easily, probably good. If it takes a lot of work, like this one, you got to crack it open. you got to do some advanced work. Generally speaking, motors will turn relatively easily. You don't have to worry about it. But you need to know that going in. Otherwise, you're going to chase your tail for a little while and have a bunch of fuses blow, not really have any idea why. Um, so always check the state of your motors. Relays. You got a big stack of switches. You got to check those. Make sure that they're in the right position. And make sure that the switches are clean. Make sure that the faces of the switches wipe against each other. It's just like a regular leaf switch. Same cleaning action happens on a relay that happens on these regular leaf switches. There is an exception. There's an exception to every rule. And that is a switch which powers something large, like another relay or a pop bumper. Uh, if you have one of those, it's going to be composed of two flat uh, switch contacts. The normal switch contacts, which you, you definitely can't see in the back, but there is a um, flat contact on the bottom and then a point that's coming down from the top. On one that activates something that's high current, like a pop bumper, coil, you just have two flat pieces. Those have to be perfectly clean, or else you're not going to get a solid pop. Um, so just check the state of those. They also, if they're dirty, will arc. Uh, an easy thing to check and see if you're having odd problems are your switches arcing. You know, if you turn the lights off, look at it. You see a bunch of green sparks. That's a clue that you've got some dirt somewhere. Some things will always arc. Uh, just because of their nature, they're very high power. Um, but generally speaking, in a relay, you don't want those sparks. Switches on a score motor, you don't want those sparks. If you can avoid them. Transformers. Looks like there's a lot of maintenance you can do on this thing, right? Nothing. <laughs> Leave it alone. Don't mess with it. If you're concerned that it's not doing its job, check across your fuses with a voltmeter. See if it's putting out the right voltages. Uh, there's going to be a fuse that protects uh, your line voltage. It actually protects the transformer. It's called your primary fuse. You can see if you've got 110 volts across that fuse. There's going to be a 50 volt or 24 volt fuse that protects your coils. Check that. And then you're going to have a 6 volt fuse or fuses to protect your lamps. Check across that. Don't bother messing with the transformer unless you absolutely have to. Um, Electromechanical games, beginning in the 1940s probably, have uh, a setting called high tap. And that's for locations where the electricity is pretty spotty. You've got a big appliance plugged in, a refrigerator plugged into the same outlet or whatever. So every time the compressor kicks on on the air conditioner or uh, refrigerator, your game powers down. Transformers on electromechanical games have a special lug for high tap. And it allows you to drive more power to the coils. Uh, the winding is actually physically different for that high tap. The problem with high tap, most of our houses, if you have a game in your house, uh, don't have those kind of electrical problems you know, from the dawn of the electrical era. Uh, things are pretty solid and reliable as far as electricity goes in our homes. So if you have your game on high tap, what's going to happen 
is that it's going to constantly be overjuiced and things can break. Um, not saying that they will break. Not every game is the same. Not every electrical situation is the same. But in most cases, you want your game on normal, not on high tap. At least test it. See what happens. Um, that is the one situation where you need to change something on the transformer. And I would say get your game working first before tanking that um, because you can make a mistake. Uh, fuses. Every game that I get, it's the first thing I do after checking my motor. Pull the fuses. All of them. Every single one. Check the values. Make sure that they match what the game says it should have. If it doesn't, that's a clue. It's a clue that somebody has been in there and found a problem and did not correct it. And if you turn it on, who knows? Um, in a worst case scenario, transformer catches on fire. You know, that's that's a bad, bad deal. So um, make sure to check uh, your fuse values. The fuses have the value stamped directly on them. Uh, it'll be 5 inches, 10 inches, 15 inches, uh, 5A, 10A, 15A. It's very important. It's crucial. Uh, put in the right values first. See what happens. If it doesn't work and the fuse blows, stop. Don't put in a higher value. Uh, putting in a higher value puts the rest of the game at risk. Um, why go down that road? Uh, all right. So, can we rely on the 50 year old fuses that are in there and just swap all of them for new ones considering they only cost like a buck? Um, I certainly rely on old fuses. Um, I'm cheap. <laughs> so, uh, the thing about fuses is that they'll blow. And uh, even old ones will blow. Now, they may be partially blown. And one of the things you can do is let's say they're the right size. How do you know if it's good or not? Take a meter, again a volt meter, and luckily I brought mine. Clark, do you have one? Clark's getting one. All right. You set your meter on continuity. You put one probe on either side of the fuse, and it'll tell you if the fuse is good or not. That's not a perfect test because the same amount of voltage is not running through that fuse as is in the game, but it's close enough. <coughs> Good. <laughs> Fantastic. So what does it mean to have a fuse partially blown? Okay, so a fuse can partially blow, and you'll know that that happened because stuff didn't work. Um, it may work for a tenth of a second. So it might test okay? It might test okay. And uh, usually the way that you know that, sometimes the fuse will have a different appearance from the way it looked when it was new. Now, let's say you're a cheapskate like and uh, you've got this game and it's got fuses in it, they're the right value. Um, one of the fuses might be a little brown inside. Uh, that's a hint that maybe it heated up. And if it did, swap in a new fuse. You can also just plug in a new fuse. You're good to go. Um, now, are EMs typically fast or slow blow, like a WPC? Typically fast. Okay. Um, now, schematics, and we'll get into those in a moment, will be labeled, whether it's fast or slow blow. Uh, Generally, it doesn't matter a whole lot if you substitute a slow blow for a fast blow in an EM. Generally. That's not 100% of the time. Try to follow what the schematic has. If that's all that you've got, it's more important to match the amperage than it is to match fast or slow. Um, it'll still blow, it'll just take longer, which means that your components will receive that over current for longer. Step switches. Went over how to clean them. Except, there's more to that story. You have to remove the nut from the spider. This little piece is called the spider. Most of the time, it's much more dramatic. It looks a lot more like the spider than this one. This only has two arms. Uh, it was the one that I could put my hands on quickly. Um, 
When you pull this off, it's important to note the position that it came off of. Some step units are continuous. There's only one coil that drives it. Some step units will have a step up and then a reset. And the reset brings it back to a default position. If it's a step up reset, you want to reset the unit back to the default before disassembly. That makes it so that you can't make a mistake when you reassemble it. The other thing that you do is take a Sharpie and mark one of the legs and the corresponding position on the phenolic disc. Some people call this brown thing the phenolic disc. Some people call it bake pipe. You can call it whatever you want. It's the thing that's got the rivets in it that conduct the electricity. So um, once you take this fighter off, you can scrub all the rivets evenly. It's important. They all have to be clean. And over that, lubricate them, reassemble. On the back side, pretty grody. Take it apart, degrease it. And you're typically good to go, especially in a home environment. If you're putting a game on location, you may want to put a touch of grease on the gears, especially on metal on metal. Bally, in particular, used uh, plastic gears, nylon gears. These nylon gears are pretty resistant to wear. Um, they're beautiful, in fact. I love Bally gears. Um, Williams, United, uh, and Scott Lee use these metal gears. Metal gears, metal on metal, is typically where you want lubrication. You know, all the time. But you've got metal on metal with the spider gear, and you've got metal on metal with the ratcheting action and the gear itself. If you don't have lubrication in your home, again, on the gear portion, it's not a problem. You're not going to exercise these games like they were on location. However, if you're putting it on location, then you're going to want a little bit of grease. Otherwise, that gear will wear down, and then your stepper will not move reliably, and you're going to have to disassemble it, find parts. Whatever the case may be. Do you just use like a white grease? Um, PBR sells grease. Um, you can use that. You can use axle grease. You can use really whatever you want. Um, as long as it moves. But the problem is, again, uh, it's going to attract dirt. Uh, it's going to eventually stop moving if you don't exercise it. So you want to uh, keep the game playing if you can especially if it's green stuff. Otherwise, clean it off. I'm good to go. Um, that's part of the beauty of EMs, by the way. You clean them, they work. Computerized games, solid state, DMD, modern games. You take all of these components and you add circuit boards. You have connectors, solid state games. They take a different form, but it's the same thing. If your connector is not conducting electricity properly, your stuff doesn't work in your solid state game. It's the same, same concept. You've got transformers, you got motors. So all this stuff builds. Now that's the thing. Uh, purely mechanical games gave way to these. Electromechanical games gave way to the solid state and DMD. And it all builds. Um, I didn't go over Jones plugs. These are kind of a biggie. It's just talking about connectors. Our old friend the Scotch Bright Pad. You just scrub the pins on the male side until they're shiny. Scrub the female side. This is a Bally Jones plug. They're constructed a little differently than the other manufacturers' plugs. As you can see, it's starting to shine up here. Um, once it's shiny, plug it in, you'll get good contact, which is important. So, that's uh, the basic and easy stuff. Next, we're going to go into something a little more difficult. But before that, these are score reels. This is one player from a game, uh, so four different score reels. Each of the score reels is basically a step switch. It has 10 different positions. Score reels 
tend to be the bane of people who are new to EM, but they are actually a lot simpler than these guys. This has 40 positions, 20 positions, and each of those has multiple connections. These have 10 positions, and there's really only three switches. Everything else is just, you know, gravy on top of it. So these three switches keep track of which number is shown. Position zero has a switch, position nine has a switch, and then every other position has a switch. So position one activates that third switch I was talking about. Um, that's all you need to know about score reels. They're actually pretty straightforward. If your switches are not lined up properly on score reels, though, uh, you're going to get weird scoring bugs. Um, score reel number two never turns. Why? Well, it's probably position nine on score reel number one isn't activated properly. Uh, so the machine doesn't get the signal that, oh, I need to turn that one. Instead, it just flips that around to zero and says, everything's good. I moved it, um, but it never moved that one. And therefore, since this one doesn't move, this one never moves, so on. Uh, that's the other thing. Problems in electromechanical games tend to be pretty straightforward, but you have to think uh, in terms of ones and zeros. These games, you got digital games, you got to think in ones and zeros, except you also have to think in all the analog ways at the same time. Uh, solid state machines are much more complex to work on than electromechanical games. So, speaking of complexity, let's add some. Uh, I've got this handy dandy sixth grade science fair project here. And uh, this has different electromechanical components, their uses, a little drawing. I've shown you the real deal. But I also have schematic symbols. So next we're going to talk about schematics. Any game that's produced after World War II, pretty much, is going to have a schematic. Games that are older probably don't. Uh, most of the time, the manufacturers just made blueprints for the games, uh, the ability to make multiple, and that was it. You know, you had to figure it out uh, in the field. So, uh, great boon, schematics. Uh, they're an electrical map of the game, and they are crucial to understanding how the game functions and uh, how to fix problems. Now, there's this is a schematic from a 1956 bingo pinball machine. I specialize a little bit in the repair and maintenance of these games. I love them. Uh, they're a type of gambling pinball. Uh, but they have a lot of circuitry. If I have a fault in one of my games, there's no way for me to find it just by poking around. I have to go to the map. I've got to be able to determine how do I get from here to here. Why isn't this moving when I want it to? So uh, let's first talk about schematic symbols, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my troubleshooting technique. Uh, again, you know, everybody's got their own. You don't have to use mine. I won't be offended. Um, this curly dealy here is a coil. And a coil, again, looks like that inside the belt. But a coil, you may notice, is a relay. Same symbol. So how do you know if it's a relay versus just a coil? The schematic will tell you. It'll typically say this is the coin relay. This is the lock relay. This is whatever relay. So that tells you to look for one of these as opposed to one of those. Motors. Motors are a circle with these two bent wires going across. And uh, anytime you see one of those, it's typically in the 120 volt section or it's very early into the smaller 24 volt or 50 volt section. Um, we've already been over that. Some of them turn, some of them don't. They should all turn. Fuses look like an S. It's like a wire that can break. And then a flat line is just a wire. So then you have a flat line with a break in it. Looks like a door. It's a switch. 
That one's normally open. A normally closed switch will be touching this other side, depending on the era. Um, when schematics were first drawn, they followed uh, electrical engineering custom at the time. So one direction open would be actually closed. And the only way to know that is to look at the legend on your schematic. If you look at your schematic and you say every single switch is open, that's a clue. It should not be. Um, there are going to be some normally closed switches. If you have a single pole double throw switch, I talked about that third type of switch that actually travels between states. It can also be called a traversal switch or it can be called a make break switch. There will be another electrical connection here and the switch will be drawn floating in the air between those two connections or one side will be connected but you can see that it can change state to the other side. Step switches. Every manufacturer drew them differently just to make life easier. So it's typically a rectangle with multiple wires coming out. Then an arrow pointing to the normal position or the index position. And the number of wires coming out determines how many steps that unit has, typically, not always. Um, because multiple rivets can be connected electrically in the same way. So let's say you have a 20-step uh, unit, but every 10 steps, the connections repeat. So mechanically, you have 20 steps, but electrically, you only have 10. Um, on the schematic, it's only going to be drawn as 10. So you may have an intermittent problem where every uh, 11th step, something doesn't happen that's supposed to. And the only way you could find that out is by testing continuity from one piece to another. Again, your meter with the beeping. It's useful, good tool. Jones plugs. That's what they look like in real life. Guess what they look like on the schematic? There's no symbol. Uh, if you're lucky, certain manufacturers will have a plug chart. The plug chart will represent one side of the plug. Not incredibly helpful if you've got 24 wires coming off and coming on. So that's 48 wires which are undocumented. To make life even more difficult, the wire colors can change from the male to female side. Uh, so it's important that you're reasonably certain that these things are clean. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you may be chasing a weird connectivity problem. I myself uh, spent a lot of time fixing a left outlane switch on a game. And uh, connections to the relay were solid. Uh, connection from the play field was solid when I was testing connectivity. When you're testing with a meter, you're running nine volts through. There's a nine volt battery inside this thing. But when the game is running, it's got to allow that potential for 24 volts to get all the way down to the relay. And the problem was I had a partially broken wire at a Jones plug on the female side. So it was buried underneath. Uh, I won't tell you how long it took me to find, uh, it took a long time. So um, connectivity problems are maddening. And they're most maddening because they're not on the map. Uh, so just make reasonably certain that they're clean. Make sure there's no broken pins, broken pins on the female side. And uh, you can kind of sort of rule that out before you get started. Not necessarily. Transformer. You might notice it looks like a coil. And then you have another coil and another coil. This is your input side. It's very long. These are your outputs. They're shorter. So the length of these sides tells you that this is coil voltage and this is lamp voltage. Uh, the schematic will also say this is your 6 volt, this is your 24 volt, this is your 110 volt. And these <coughs> represent the plates that are inside the transformer, the iron plates. So, schematics. My method for troubleshooting, again, this is just my method. Everything on the schematic uh, has a representation in the physical, the real world. So, uh, let's say I'm trying to fix 
a lamp that doesn't light. Um, <coughs> a person who is much smarter than me once told me to think of alternating current in a pinball machine as DC. Um, if any of you are familiar with uh, direct current, you'll know that there it's it's a lot simpler to think about because the current moves straight from the source to the ground. Boom, completes the circuit. So uh, you don't have to worry about it moving back and forth. You don't have to think about any of that. So if you just knock that out of your head right away, it makes troubleshooting a lot simpler. So let's take a, a lamp. On the schematic, lamps are circles. So it looks very similar to a motor, but don't be fooled. <laughs> There's straight lines coming into it, just wires. This is card light number one on the schematic. The only thing that's between it and the source and destination here is a single switch. That's pretty straightforward. The thing the schematic doesn't tell you is there's a Jones plug in between two. So the first thing, make sure your Jones plugs are clean. All right, that's done. You only have one switch in between. Clean the switch. Make sure it's gapped appropriately. And make sure when the ball hits it, it closes. And then that light should light up. If your socket is bad, that light will never work. But um, you can test that by testing the voltage at the socket. Um, okay, can, you, can you use a continuity tester on either side of a Jones plug to see if, if the corrosion is causing the problem? Yes, but in the example that I gave, sometimes that's not enough because the amount of voltage that is present from this is too low. Uh, so yeah, it'll, it'll conduct this but it might not conduct full coil voltage. That's an extreme example. And you would just test it on Either the, the exposed point of the wires that correspond, or how would you do it? So, coming in from the top, you've got these solder rivet looking things. They're not rivets. Um, you can put the continuity on one side of there, and then on the bottom side, under the female side, there is this little tab that sticks out. And you just put the meter on there and it'll be. But again, that'll tell you that the plug is okay. And that's basically it. Um, it won't tell you that the circuit is actually all right. Um, so. Can I ask, why don't you have to clean inside the female side of the Jones plug? So you, you do. just plug the surface? This is a ballet plug and they're funky. Uh, so. Uh, four, Gottlieb plugs, Williams plugs, uh, United plugs, some of them. Um, they have a different female side, which is basically fully enclosed. And the pin uh, from the male side will actually be squeezed as it goes all the way through. Cleaning just the top of those will not do. Um, for those, I cleaner. Yeah, that works very well. Thread through, closet. So, coils. Lots of coils on here. Let's pick a feature and see what makes it work. Here we go. Diagonal score control step up. All right. We have separate scores relay V switch. So this tells me there's a relay called separate scores somewhere in the machine. And the second switch is the one that I need to focus on. The schematic has it drawn as a make break or a single pole double throw. So that narrows it down even further. I need to make sure that that changes state when the relay changes state. I need to make sure it's reasonably clean. If that doesn't fix the problem, you carry on down. There's a switch that's on the motor. Okay, clean that switch, make sure it's gapped appropriately, carry on down. Then you get down to the score's step-up disc. Now, let's say it's getting the signal to fire, but it's never stepping. It needs to be disassembled, clean, reassembled. And then generally your problem is solved. Again, most of your problems are gonna be dirt somewhere. 
So you just have to find the right path and then go down it. Uh, I tend to go from the coil or from the lamp, from the feature that I'm actually trying to fix, back down through the ladder logic until I get to a likely suspect. Try cleaning that, see what happens. And you are tracing colored wires or you're looking for a sticker on the relay that says that matches your schematic or? Generally, you look for the label on the, the, on the uh, bottom board or in, in the back of the game that matches uh, the one that you're looking for. So in this case, separate scores relay. It would have a little sticker There'd on it. There'd be a little sticker somewhere. Okay. Let's say there's not. Mice have eaten it. Um, that makes life really interesting. <laughs> Uh, that's where a little experience comes in. You, know, you can kind of find your way around after you've been inside a few games. But let's say this is your first, and you happen to get that barn project uh, <laughs> that rats have eaten all the wires from and stored a bunch of acorns inside or whatever. You got a lot of work ahead of you, but um, in that case, wire colors are key. But there's a but. The Jones switch. Well, the Jones plugs. I just love to eat wire, <laughs> and especially the insulation that's on the wire. Most of the wire in an electromechanical machine is going to be cloth covered, and mice will just shoot through that. Love it. It's a favorite thing. So um, that can make life really difficult, and uh, depending on the game, uh, you may need somebody to take photos of an affected area and send them to you that has that game. Um, it, all, it all depends on how bad the damage is. Um, the other thing, a lot of games that I like to fix have been in smoky bars for decades. Uh, all the wire colors become brown. Uh, you know, it, it makes it hard to trace the colors, so that's where the physical component comes in. So why I made special mention of it being a make-break switch, there's usually only one, maybe two of those inside a relay. So you got a 50-50 shot of picking the right one. Um, normally they're also labeled, so uh, B switch. That tells me it's the second one in that relay. Uh, so you have, again, increased chance of success. Um, and, let's see. And, and relays only pulse, right? They don't stay clamped down? Incorrect. They do stay clamped? They do, sometimes. Oh. Um, everything has an exception. So I mentioned that before. <laughs> Lock relays are the exception. So there are some uh, high-duty, heavy-duty relays, like this one here. This is for a ball lifter, and it remains engaged most of the time. Uh, so the windings on it are such that it won't burn up after being engaged for a long period of time. Lock relays on games are used to turn on the GI when you first plug the game and turn it on. Um, a lot of Williams games, for example, you have to hit the left flipper switch, and then the uh, play field lights come on, that's the lock relay. Um, the lock relay also provides power to coils throughout the game. So it's a very important relay, uh, but it's got to be powered all the time or else your game will go dead. Um, so there's a few relays like that, but they're by far the exception. Most of them are just single pulse, boom, done. Um, so unless it's something like a lock relay or it's labeled hold relay, or something like that, it's safe to assume that it's just a pulse. Um, now as far as wire colors, you got that game that's full of tar, um, but you've reached a point where you need to know what the wire color is for whatever reason. You got that mouse game um, that also has a lot of tar. They love it, love it all. A lot of mice like to smoke. So uh, you can take soap and water, put it in a little dish, put a toothbrush in, scrub the wire. It's cloth. won't hurt anything. Um, and uh, sometimes the color will come back enough for you to be able to tell. So talking about wire colors, that brings us to another point. You might notice each of these wires has a different distinct pattern on it. Some of them are a solid color, but most of them have two different colors on them. Wire colors on the schematics are noted with two colors. Um, there's going to be the solid wire color, which is the main, the base color, in this case, yellow. And then there's what's called the tracer color, and that's a little stitch that's put into every so often in the wire of a different color. In this case, it's 
black, or maybe green, not sure. Um, <laughs> and uh, every wire is like that in the game. Valley schematics are some of my favorites because they tell you how often that same color combination was used elsewhere in the game. So by the time you get to um, over here, the other thing, instead of actually just writing the color, they used a, a color code, a number code. In this case, I'm looking at one that's called 43. And four is the solid color that's green, three yellow. So it's green with the yellow tracer. And this is wire number seven that has that same color scheme. Uh, that can be helpful if you see green, yellow elsewhere in the machine, you may say, oh, I bet there's a break somewhere from here to there. That's not necessarily the case. You, you cannot trust that. Wire colors are incredibly unreliable. And uh, during uh, the war and thereafter, uh, wire, there was wire shortage. And so the schematic may show certain wire colors on games from the 40s, but in reality, they had to substitute something else. There's typically a notice that's tacked into the back of the game, but again, mice like to eat. So uh, it may not be in there, and again, that typically impacts games from the 40s. Uh, so I've got a few different examples of schematics up here from different manufacturers in different eras, but the constant are these schematic symbols. These same schematic symbols are also used in solid state games. How many people here have an EM? And uh, how many people here have a working EM? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so another useful tool in your arsenal is the manual. Most games that are made after 1972 have a manual. Unless you're talking about gambling pinballs, and most of them have a manual. The more complex the machine, the more likely it is to have a manual. Most flipper pinball machines uh, are not incredibly, incredibly complex. You've got a switch that makes a thing go. You just have to find that switch. So that's where all the uh, labels and documentation, schematics come. Um, if you're working on a game pre-war, then you're kind of on your own a little bit. You've got to actually do a lot of continuity testing to figure out what goes where. Um, but those are some of the uh, most fun games to work on, actually. So do they use terminology we would recognize? Like if we know our left out lane switch isn't working, can you go to the schematic and look for left out lane? Absolutely. So let's see. This is a game from 1947. We've got open when energized on tilt relay. Tilt. Um, we've got number one relay with a number one switch. Uh, those kind of things are going to correspond with the items on the play field. Um, and again, all I do, there's no secret to it, you just work your way back from the element and eventually you'll hit upon the thing. That's the problem. Uh, broken wires. Uh, those kind of things happen. Uh, one other good tip, is just lightly tug on a wire that you think is suspect. And if it comes off in your hands, you know. Um, it may look just fine visually, but uh, once you give it just a light tug, it may be marginal enough that it comes off. Um, in that case, you just solder it back the way you go? Yeah. That's it. Give it another tug. <laughs> just, keep, just keep pulling. Until the whole wire comes up. Um, that one's done. So uh, aside from that, one other tip. This is just a general tip. You see these switches here? They have, they're composed of two tabs in the back. Those tabs are where they actually soldered the wire to on the switches. If those tabs touch, then the switch is constantly shorted. And it will always register as closed. Uh, make sure that your switch tabs are apart. A lot of times, one side will be insulated. It depends on the manufacturer, depends on the era. But if one side is insulated, then it's unlikely to be touched. 
touch it. It can happen though. If the insulation is burned or whatever, just always take, take a look at your switch tabs. And then another word about score reels. I kind of breezed over these. Uh, one important thing to remember when you're cleaning these is that the ink, which has the numbers, can be very, very fragile. That also depends on the manufacturer and the era. Um, so a good rule of thumb is just treat them all like they're uh, incredibly uh, precious gems. <laughs> or you may have no numbers. Uh, the way to clean those, I don't even use plastic polish. I think it's too abrasive in some cases. Um, what I will use is soap and water. Just put soap and warm water, more soap than water, in a little dish, rub it around, rinse it off, a little towel action in between, and uh, you'll generally get all the dirt off. Um, if you want to test a plastic polish to give it a nice shine, uh, just do a little, little test sample. See what happens. Um, if the ink comes off, you'll have your answer. Don't do it. Um, should those be like motors where you can spin them freely in the back of the game to test their no. heaviness or whatever? Okay. Remember, there's an exception to everything. So, Midway games, like gun games and uh, some of their other arcade games, did have motorized score uh, units or drum units. These are, uh, these are stepped. So you pulse the coil. Don't turn from here or you might destroy uh, the plastic gearing inside. Um, always step from the coil. If it doesn't step, take it apart. Can wrong. you get your finger into all of them and step into all of them? Okay. Not easily, <laughs> but yes. And uh, that's a good place to start. Uh, if your reels do not zero, your game will never start. Um, but your reels not zeroing may not be the fault of the score reels either. Uh, so again, Knowing your schematic is important. Where, where would you look? If uh, this gets into an intermediate area. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, every. <laughs> Let's start it now. <laughs> um, simply, uh, when you put in a coin, it's going to activate a reset relay or some type of reset mechanism. That reset mechanism is going to zero everything out and get the game ready to play. Um, if that relay doesn't engage, it won't do it. Um, but if it engages and never disengages. What if, uh, say, the ones place is stuttering just before it gets to the zero, like it doesn't get all the way back to zero? Is that just dirt? That's probably mechanical. Okay. Um, so I would take that score reel apart and make sure everything's clean inside. Um, grease. Operators uh, tended, in some cases, to do quick fixes. And it all depends on the operator, the location, you know, what was going on on a Tuesday when this game went down. And uh, the idea is to get it up and running as quickly as possible, generally. <coughs> so in some cases, you know, they'll shoot some grease in there. You know, got a stuttering reel. OK, well, now it works for that day. <laughs> um, if it sits for a while, it cakes up. Cakes up. You're done. All of a sudden, you're done. Yeah. But a stuttering reel can also be uh, a switch that's arcing. Okay. Or barely making. Uh, so, so clean the reels and the uh, or clean the switches and the reels. Clean. Yeah. Clean in general. Clean in general. Yes. And um, then Thank you. you should be good to go. Yeah. Thank you. Um. So. Final thoughts. Any questions? Well, you know, a lot of the times you see like an EM on Craigslist that the you know, owner it hasn't worked for a while, they don't know what's going on. Um, what are the kind of like high points that you look at in a game to see if it, you know. If it will work again? Yeah, if it will work again. <laughs> or what are some of the most you know, common things that could go wrong? So uh, one of the things that I do is look for missing parts. Um, some parts are common and you'll be able to find them relatively easily or even with a call to pinball resource. Um, some parts are much harder to find or game specific and in those cases you're out of luck um, unless somebody else has destroyed one um, you'll never find it in those cases uh, you just got to look at it and see all right score motor is missing uh, you may be able to find one from another collector who's parted one out but uh, 
let's say you've got a specific motor that handles some kind of play field animation and that's missing, you're probably out of luck. Um, look for missing parts. Uh, look for bound motors. Look for fire. And um, generally, that's all you need. Uh, if the machine inside is covered in smoke damage, uh, you might, might want to stay away. If the machine inside has an active, active rodent infestation, you might want to stay away. But uh, other than that, just about anything's fixable, given enough time. That's okay. So like paint, like I'm I'm losing paint on a game, mm -hmm. and I, I've talked to you about this, but so like I know that you talked. If you have a situation where you have paint that's lifting mm -hmm. off the game, what's the best way to treat that without doing like a clear coat or anything? Like, do you suggest mill wax? Yeah, I suggest some kind of protective wax, okay. and try that first. Um, the reason being, you can always go heavier. It's harder to go light. But then cleaning wise as well. I mean, what's, what's, I mean, with the amount of, you know, it's, it has dirt on it. Like, what do you, what's the first thing you're going to go to to test to see if it's going to do any damage to the existing paint? Well, no wax, for example, <coughs> is billed as a cleaning wax. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. So you can, you can try that and see. Sometimes you're going to need something more. Abrasive or right. hardcore, and in that case, you just kind of need to test it. Okay. And see. If if the paint is lifting off, I've got the same thing on the glass on the head. The paint's starting to come off a little bit. On the back glass. Yeah, on the back glass. And if the paint is lifting off the back glass, and you were to apply that lotion for the for the mill wax, wouldn't it just take all the paint off? Yes. Okay. So, so that's a different scenario. That? Okay. Uh, he's talking about the actual cap. <clears throat> okay. The lower cap. For the back glass, uh, there's a product called Krylon Crystal Clear. Um, it used to be called Triple Thick. And basically, you can spray it on and then wrap it with uh, saran wrap, and it will uh, adhere the paint back to the glass. But there's a downside to that. You need to mask off any score windows or clear areas of the glass, or else uh, you're going to have hazing. Okay. Um, and it'll look real bad. There's also, you know, the potential to just play it. It just depends. You know, you got to kind of be your own judge there. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? What's the first when you get a new game that you haven't played? It's coming out of somebody's garage, and you're saving it. What's the first three things that you do when you get it to your house? Um, check motors. Check fuses. Uh, check the quality of the line cord itself. A lot of times the line cord will be chewed up by mice. They like those too. They like everything that's good. Um, make sure that that's okay and safe, and uh, make sure that it's reasonably clean. You know, vacuum down. And so when you go in, you like are adjusting the motors, like just to see if they're turning. Yeah. Do you need to take them back to zero, or will they no. find their? They'll find zero on their own. When they'll you find start it up. Okay. They'll find out. Um, so I breeze over that, but there's a switch that governs that movement. So it'll okay. say, oh, it's not at zero. Keep going. Now I'm at zero. But like Stop. the spider switches, like those, those you need to go back to zero. You need to go back to where they were when you disassembled them. If you disassemble this, that's where marking comes in. Right. So okay. you need to mark them before disassembly. Okay. And how do you know if it's got the, the zeroing thing? You said some, some of those have the zeroing mechanism. There will be two coils. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So this, this only has one. Gotcha. Um, this one does as well. But. Here it is. Uh, this has a space for it. You see this ah. area here? Mm -hmm. If there was a coil there, it would lift this ratchet up and the other one, and it would whoop, whoop, whip back to zero. Through a spring load? Yes. Yeah. So both coils. Engage both coils at once. It resets itself. It will typically just engage the one. Oh. There's an exception. <laughs> you find all the exceptions. Um, Valley, in certain circumstances, made units where it would pulse both coils to reset because it had a um, step up and step down action, so just one step at a time. But if it pulsed both, it would zero out. Uh, but that's really weird and rare. Um, unusual, I should say. So. All right.